Um, so, hello. Um, I'm Edo. I'm the uh, chief technologist of the uh, digital strategy practice in, uh, in Deloitte. Uh, in my day-by-day -day, uh, work, I build prototypes mostly, uh, and I deal with uh, R&D um, prototypes and um, venture technology mostly. Um, so one of my um, current projects are, well, two projects mainly. One is a, a massive simulation engine for what-if decisions basically on uh, supply chains and stuff. It's built on Go. Um, and the other one is a, a self-driving ship system, uh, still built on Go. Um, and I'm experimenting a lot with uh, Fushi OS. And in my spare time, I, uh, I bake bread with, uh, with my wife and I have a sourdough bread. Its name is Penelope. Um, so I have three things on my bucket list. Uh, the first one is to have to see free and sustainable energy through fusion. The second one is to see the first man on Mars. And the third one is to see Fushio OS released in the wild. Um, two I think are, are achievable. Another one probably not. Um, I'll let you decide which is which. But anyway, um, so this talk is mostly uh, architectural, so I'll describe what Fuchsia is. Um, uh, we'll go a little bit under the hood, so um, what are its concepts uh, and why they're relevant for us as, as developers. Uh, so mostly um, the new concepts such as uh, the module stories, the ledger and the Maxwell system, we'll go into that. And then how to develop an app uh, in Fuchsia. Uh, so uh, both with Go and with the uh, new UI system. And then I'll make some, uh, some wild prediction, outrageous prediction on, on its future. Happy path and challenging path. All right, so first of all, what's the state of the hardware uh, in 2018, 2019? Uh, we have a lot of dispersion. So a lot of devices, uh, two-in-ones, uh, convertibles, uh, mobile, um, we have uh, smart assistant screens, uh, PC is still here, uh, smart watches, and this thing which is coming, which is the, uh, the new um, Oculus, um, I don't remember its name. Anyway, so it's, it's a new platform for VR. Um, and probably this one will be the one for VR. Uh, so it's a $400 device, which will li uh, very likely uh, bring VR into everyone's uh, home. Uh, if there is a device, this is one. So basically, as developers, we, ha we are forced uh, to develop an app for ev each and every one of those. So the promise is that, well, we can develop you know, on Android or iOS or something else. But actually, in reality, we have, uh, we have Chrome OS, uh, which runs Android as well. Uh, we have Android. We have iOS. Which we have those devices there, which runs a, an operating system called Cast, w whatever that is, uh, and Windows, et cetera, et cetera. So there is there is the case and the pressure for convergence. So basically for one operating system to be truly um, uh, supported by everything. Um, and um, apparently Linux, it's, it's not it. Uh, or for, for now at least, it's, it's not Linux. So what is Fuchsia then? Um, so it's three things. Uh, it's a new OS uh, from Google. Um, it's a new, uh, you, you know, it's a new take on user experience, and the third one is a Google project with all the, you know, ups and downs of a Google project. So the first one is, well, it's a new OS, OS. so it can run on any device. That's a promise, at least, uh, and it's not based on a Linux kernel. So they have developed a new kernel called Zircon, and it's built on C, uh, C plus plus. Sorry. Uh, the idea is that this operating system can run mostly on embedded systems, smartphone, tablets, everything, everywhere. Um, it has some cool ideas, and we'll go into the de uh, into details later. But basically, the state of an app is shared between multiple devices via cloud or via a peer-to-peer -peer, um, type of system. Um, and again, yeah, it's it's based on a microkernel uh, called Zircon. Um, it's it's a cloud-based ledger. This thing which shared shares the, uh, the state of an app between um, different uh, operating systems and different devices. Um, nothing to do with blockchains right now. Uh. 
Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I hear it all the time. Let's do blockchain or anyway. Um, the second one is, uh, it's a modern take on user experience. So it's completely different from whatever you've seen now. Uh, and, and this is why it's very relevant, I think, for developers. Um, so it's an assistant first operating system um, and it's open source. So whatever assistant you might think of, uh, you, you can embed uh, an assistant there. Um, so, and then everything is modular. So you don't have the concept of an app, you have a concept of a package, but then this package is composed of multiple components and then you also have maybe an app there. But it's truly uh, different from whatever we are used to, to develop. So you don't have one binary, we have a, you have a system of binary which compones one app. Um, and you can think about it as microservices on steroids, basically. It's very, very, you have tiny functions, you have microservices, et cetera, but on use in the, in the user, user facing, basically. Um, and we'll talk about this uh, in, in a bit more detail if you have time. Yeah, right. Um, and then the third is that it's, a, um, it's another Google project. So depending on who you ask, it's the best thing ever that happened you know, after chocolate or it's just another pet project and someone is saying that this is just a pet project just to retain dev leads in the company, which is likely or it's likely both. Um, the team itself uh, advertises this project as the next big thing after Android. So the idea is that after the uh, you know Java Oracle uh, type of you know debacle with Android and Google, um, they basically uh, you know want to develop a new operating system, basically, which doesn't have the problem that Java has, um, and you know with with all the problems with Oracle. Um, however, if the release of this operating system is not well orchestrated between the, uh, all the uh, operating system type of family of Google, it could become messy because you have Android, Chrome OS, and Fuchsia, and Cast, which is another operating system that they run. So anyway, it's, it's, a, good, it's a nice experiment, I think. All right, uh, under the hood. So um, here I'll talk a little bit about the uh, architectural um, uh, type of patterns of uh, Fuchsia. So the first thing is that Fuchsia is composed mostly on, of four layers. Uh, there's the kernel called Zircon. Uh, Garnet is the uh, is the part where drivers the, where the drivers are. Perido is where the app management system is, and then the other uh, the top layer uh, Topaz is the one where the UI basically it's based. Uh, you can have a Fuchsia OS uh, without the top layer, and then it's an embedded system, basically. So you, you could run it also on a server, although it's mainly for, um, for user-facing type of uh, things. All right, so this is where, where it gets interesting. So you don't have an application on Fuchsia. You don't have one app. You have a package. That this package is split into data files called entities, and then you have components. Now, these components are again split into two, and you have modules and agents. So agents, you can think about it as like background tasks, um, and modules are where the app, you know, like a UI type of app is. Now, why is that? And, and, and then modules are tagged with nouns and verbs. We, we have a potato here, so just there's a potato for you there waiting for you, so uh, hear me out. So the idea is that this is an operating, it's a, an assistant first operating system. So the idea is that you ask the operating system, for example, watch TV with friends. So if you tag your module with a verb such as watching, then when you ask the operating system watch, then it will get whatever app you're using, uh, you, you want to use, right? So uh, watching at, uh, something, then you know maybe Netflix uh, is being tagged with a verb called watching. So it will grab uh, Netflix, for example. Uh, with friends, uh, then friends could then grab something like WhatsApp, etc. And then it will um, basically bring these two things together. We will go into, into details later. Um, and then, watch TV with friends becomes a story. 
and the state of something is on the story. We'll, we'll, we'll get into details later uh, of, of, of this. So basically you don't have, I want, uh, for example, you, you may think, you know, I need to, I don't know, write a, um, I don't know, like a document or something, and then you open up the document and then Google Keep and whatever. So in Fuchsia, those, this is a story. Uh, your task is a story, and then it has different apps uh, inside it. We'll go into detail later. Here's your potato. Yeah, you're still with me? Okay. The stories. So um, you, the, the idea is that whenever you are doing anything with your computer or whatever, you're actually, uh, you know, uh, you're doing something, you're, you're writing a task, you, you know, you want to do something, program or whatever. Uh, and then you have your documentation here and your, uh, you know, IDE there. That's the story. Um, and the, the share and the story will have a shared state. So basically, whatever happens in the IDE, for example, it will be shared with the uh, documentation, etc. And this is where the agents comes in. So basically, uh, whatever is a story, it will have a shared state. Um, and this state will be synchronized between different devices. So as a developer, you should think about small tasks so basically instead of doing you know i want to write an app for you know for for a specific thing you need to decouple your app into whatever tiny actions exactly like a microservice basically into whatever tiny action your user might might do um so that's stories then we have the ledger uh, the ledger is this uh, uh, it's mostly cloud-based and it's a way of synchronizing uh state uh, and stories between all your devices. Um, every story is completely private, so you, uh, the two states cannot th uh, talk with each other. Uh, however, again, within one story, um, the, the state is shared. Uh, the ledger is uh, open, so you can use it via uh, like a cloud, any cloud vendor, basically. It could also be peer-to-peer, -peer, which is cool. Uh, um, but currently, it runs on uh, Firebase, of course. Uh, and it's offline first, so basically you don't have any sort of logic uh, in the cloud. Uh, and uh, yeah, you have merge policies, uh, which should solve um, data projects, uh, sorry, data conflicts within the app. And then we have entities. Um, now, uh, do we have game developers in the audience? No game developers? Yeah, game developers? Okay, cool. Uh, so, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the entity component system. So this is something. Uh, so entity component system is a uh, is an architectural pattern in a game uh, and in new, newer game engine where basically everything is divided into entity, which is an item basically, and then you have components. Uh, so basically you can have, for example, speed entity and then location component within the speed entity, and then you have systems, and the systems will act on uh, entities and components and all of that. So Fuchsia takes this gaming type of concept and transforms it into uh, a, an OS uh, type of thing. So basically whatever is a thing, it's an entity. Um, so person, for example, etc. And this is for sharing stuff between apps. So for example, let's say that you want to copy paste a, an artist from one app to, to sp from Spotify to YouTube, for example. But because you have this sort of semantic uh, thing, basically you copy, you paste in YouTube and YouTube automatically recognizes that that's an artist. Um, and so again, for uh, the, the 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 assistant of the operating system will know what you're doing, and you know that 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 guy is is an artist or that person is an artist. Um, cool, right? And then we have Maxwell, which is basically the uh, app management system, which manages all these micro uh, type of uh, apps uh, and agents uh, between one and another, and it queues them, and it gives them um, priority. All right, so how to develop an app on Fuchsia? Okay, so first of all, Fuchsia is mainly, well, yeah, yeah. so basically it's um, a large part of Fuchsia is built on Go. Uh, uh, we will see it later, but basically mostly the uh, network stack and the uh, CVS stack, so uh, control, ver uh, the, the uh, control version and system is built with Go. 
Um, the um, the C plus plus layer is the um, is the core. The C layer are the drivers. Go is for everything or mostly everything uh, networking. S S F T P. Uh, uh, Python, mostly machine learning stuff. And then we have Rust, which is cool as well. Um, I don't remember what Rust is for, but anyway. Uh, and then Shell, uh, but Shell is mostly for building uh, Fuchsia itself, so it's not really relevant. Uh, these are, uh, you know, few um, packages of, of Go uh, built with Fuchsia. I think one of the in interesting part is that also for for us to to, to to develop basically every third party um repo that they have they have replicated it uh, they have forked it replicated it and then they modified it directly so they don't have any sort of third party dependencies uh even go they have um forked the entire go repo um so that then they can directly compile with their version or uh, of go uh, in the operating system and that's another thing you can basically do uh, you can write a um a program in go uh, and then let the operating system compile uh because it has go pre-installed so you can ship basically not binaries which is cool um right so netrostack is built on go but also uh the version control system um they have yeah package manager they have a key value store storage and then uh, all the infrastructure um, um the, the, yeah the package manager for updates etc and then all the infrastructure code is built on on go and ci cd uh which for some some reason is 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 there i'm not sure why it's there but anyway um so two ways to develop an app um well for low level agents so again these tiny agents, you can build it with whatever programming language you want. Uh, again, Rust and Go are the most um, maybe useful in this case um, because they are, you know, you, you can basically compile it directly with the operating system. Uh, you will have any x86-64 or ARM right now will, will do uh, architecture uh, target. Um, and there is a special Fuchsia flag, so uh, your binary will be Fuchsia x 64 and stuff like that. And this is for anything agent or backhand, but basically anything agent, you can do it with Go. However, for the UI, and this is uh, interesting, I don't know if you know about Flutter. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they have heavily uh, used Flutter. So basically Flutter is a... Uh, it's, it's kind of a mobile app development kit um, for uh, Android and iOS, uh, developed by Google, uh, built in Dart, so you, you, you are actually writing in Dart. Uh, and anything UI in Fuchsia, you will do it with, Dart, uh, with uh, Flutter. Uh, it makes a lot of sense because it's, a, uh, it's mobile first and cross-platform, so you can compile once and then you can run it also on your Android or iOS uh, deployment, so not just on Fuchsia. Um, and they claim native performance. I'm not really sure about it because uh, uh, Flutter has a, a rendering engine, so it's not like uh, React Native or something like that, which, you know, um, so it, it has a, a rendering engine. Not sure it's, it's native, but, you know, there you go. Right, and then, um, Armadillo, so Flutter, rendering, uh, rendering engine, and UI. Armadillo is basically the name for um, the uh, main UI of, of uh, Fuchsia, which is very, very material design, so Google-ish material design, lots of whites, lots of shades, and all of that. Um, the cool stuff is that they basically they manage all the theming and componing for you, so you don't need to style basically anything, which is cool, I think. Oh, we're already there. What time? Oh, okay, cool, cool. All right, so um, future of Fuchsia. So I have two, three main ideas about Fuchsia. So first of all, I'm using Fuchsia for, um, which is outrageously uh, unstable right now, um, but I'm using especially the kernel for my uh, self-driving ship project uh, because it's uh, mostly a, it's an embedded system and it runs on um, very very uh, nasty places uh, uh, 
uh, engine rooms of ships and tankers and, and all of that. So I'm testing it there. Um, it's it's very stable. I mean, the, the kernel is stable. Uh, Fuchsia is absolutely not. Uh, so I'm testing it there. Um, and right now it's it's quite fast. Uh, it's not as fast as, as Linux right now, which is um, interesting. But uh, anyway, there you go. All right, so what I think could happen, the happy path, is that, uh, well, the operating system could gradually be released and integrated into everything Google. So the idea is that uh, it will be released in 2019 or 2020. Uh, ev uh, it will be probably mentioned in this Google I.O. this year or next year, but probably this year. Um, and the happy path is that likely all the pixel lines will gradually move into Fuchsia. You will still probably have some sort of Android um, uh, compatibility on it, but the idea will be that you know all the Android operating system will be gradually moved into into Fuchsia. Um, and uh, and again, you can already run Fuchsia actually on the Pixel Book Alliance and um, in in a few months on the Pixel Slate and on any. Uh, pixel phone. So that's the happy path, which um, I, I th yeah, probably will never happen, but um, because Google. Um, but anyway, so this is how, how it, they can do it. Then there is the exception path, uh, which is, uh, well, it could become very, very messy, and there are three ways that it could become messy. The first one is the Hangout, Duo, uh, Android messages way, which is there is no synchronization whatsoever between their their teams. Uh, they release Fuchsia and then they start with the internal fighting. Exactly, I don't know if you know about the Pixel and HTC uh, type of problems that there has been, but basically Google has acquired the HTC hardware team to design the Pixel 4, and the the Pixel 3 uh, basically developers they and the Pixel 4 developers, they have started fighting with each other. And there are some outrageous conspiracy theories which says that the, all the, um, the leaks that have happened in the, you know, from August till now with the Pixel 3, those are caused, caused by these, uh, these problems with the two teams. Anyway, so yeah, the first one is, is that fighting. The, s the second one is uh, the Google Wave way. So basically, it's a nice idea. However, the concepts are too different from the current developer and user experience, especially this thing about the apps um, and the, uh, the agents and the verbs and all of that, because we are quite used to develop you know, one binary or in the case of a microservice type of uh, swarm, several, but you know, on the UI level, it's, you know, it's, it could be messy. Uh, the third one is uh, the Google Plus way. So it's killed, it's dead on arrival. Uh, it's been released, you know, it gets released, but, you know, uh, e either too late or it's too new. And so it joins, uh, you know, other people like Windows Mobile and WebOS, rest in peace. Um, well, it, it leaves, I think, on, on, on some Samsung device, WebOS, or maybe on the TVs, LG TVs, I don't remember. However, I think that there is a third way. Because this is an assistant first uh, open source operating system. So this means that there are some companies uh, which think that uh, the future is assistant driven. Uh, and those are mostly <coughs> the companies that have you know, successful uh, assistants. Google, Amazon, IBM, f yeah, and whatever Facebook and Google Oculus are currently doing. So because this is an operating system and it's an assistant first operating system, it might be that these companies could actually take on this uh, operating system and make it their own, um, especially because uh, you have all this, like the Echo Dot, for example, it runs on a Fire, Fire OS, which is a, a fork of Android, et cetera. So basically, this one could be the operating system for anything assistant, which could be, uh, which could be interesting. Um, so I suggest, I suggest you just have a look at, uh, at, at Fuchsia. Um, every, it has Go, it supports Go, it supports Rust, 
everything in the future it's probably going there so uh, the operating system that it supports are you know the new uh, programming languages so uh, again go uh, rust uh, Python etc so I consider fuchsia you know a very good indicator of where the future of development is going and what will be supported in the future likely there is no jo uh, the, yeah Java is not there which I, I really really hope that that's where we're going um, yeah, all right, um, and also it could it could be, you know, it could be that if an open source system gets released, it will probably be supported by this platform. So uh, that could be another another uh, possibility. I'm done. Um, yeah, I'm done. Hope you like it. Questions? Sure. Um, sh um, oh, yeah, okay. So. Uh, just a fast question. Uh, since they're using a fork of Go, how do they backport patches? Is there a plan for that? Is there an um, automated task, if you know, or, or uh, it's just For the other repos? Yeah, for the external repos that they just backported. Uh, yeah, um, git pull. Um, oh, okay, okay. So and they then just git pull. push. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. one thing uh, in Google, we have five more charts than the three you listed. Sorry? Uh, you listed three chats? Yeah. It must, it, it's much, <laughs> worse, much worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, I think that the Google chat, the Verge, I don't know if you listened to the Verge cast or something like that, but basically, um, uh, you know, the, the, the joke is, oh, you know, maybe Google will release another messenger app this year, etc. But I, I love the experimentation of Google. I mean, it's it's absolutely you know it's 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 absolutely amazing. The problem is that yeah, it's poorly coordinated. But any any big companies like that, so you know, it's it's okay. Hello, thank you for Hi. talk. Um, I have a question. You mentioned the performance issues. Um, there's always a fight between microkernels and mono monolithic kernels. Why do you know why they choose the microkernel? And do you have uh, data on the impact impact on performance, power-wise and uh, performance-wise? So, sure. So um, I do not have data there. It's my uh, it's it's basically my feeling right now on the on the performance issue. Uh, I think it's mostly related to the network stack, to be honest, because um, when I. Uh, it's, it has a poor, right now it's poor supported, the, uh, the, all the network stack. Uh, and also I need to basically attach an Arduino somewhere. So that's another, another problem. Um, your question about microkernels. Yes, uh, it has to do, I believe, the use of microkernel, I, I think it has to do with the problem of, uh, it's, it's basically the problem of Linux, which has become too massive right now. Like the, the current, I think uh, repo of Linux is, is very big. So the idea of microkernels is that you basically rewrite everything just to accept new hardware, so you don't need to support anything before. Um, and also, uh, this microkernel at least uh, supports a multi-core by default, while on Linux is a bit different. I don't know if you are. So Okay, thank you. Yeah. Think. Thanks for a nice talk, Eduardo. Uh, so my question is, since you've been doing some very low-level hardware work with Fuchsia, could you speak very briefly about some of those interfaces as far as things like GPIO or I2C, SPI interfaces, the low-level hardware interfaces that we would normally associate with actual embedded systems uh, as far as more traditional connected sensor type applications? Um, so I use Protobuf basically. I just I just use Protobuf for uh, with uh, with that kernel. So um, I, I, I'm basically using Protobuf for uh, chat, basically to communicate with the hardware, um, and then I'm using uh, some um, uh, hardware. Uh, um, what's its name? I don't remember. Uh, 
uh, Modbus. I'm also using Modbus for the hardware communication. Uh, the problem, uh, so protobuf is basically for hardware to hardware, and then Modbus is for you know to to communicate within a different uh, type of components and um, and the sensors. Um, I believe that the the problem right now is, is is there because it's it's so new. The drivers supports just the drivers supports protobuf, but they don't support Modbus, for example, right now. So I do not recommend absolutely right now to do anything on that. Um, I have it on two ships. Uh, on ten. We we have ten ships out, and I have it on two ships where I can jump on it if there is any problem. All the ships in Asia, they have a Linux kernel with a Raspberry Pi. But the, the idea is that you can run it on a Raspberry Pi right now. So if you need to experiment, you can. But it's, I don't recommend it, basically. We can chat offline if you want you know, more information. <laughs> cool. Um, hey, uh, hey, I do have one question. You've sure. mentioned that uh, there is certain code, a certain amount of code written with Python for machine yeah. learning. Yeah. So the, here's my question. Uh, most of the Python machine learning libraries are written in C or C++. Yeah. And even Go, uh, even Google uh, started porting their TensorFlow Tensor into the Go. So yeah. what's the reason using Python with its huge runtime instead of just using uh, C Go extension for that? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're right. It's TensorFlow. Um, I think it's. Uh, I think the reason is simple. It's for prototyping. I think that the, uh, in order to use, it's quicker right now to experiment with Python than it is with something more. Yeah, I know. But like for example, in our like for example in our practice, we have in in Deloitte we have you know like a da data scientist type of you know uh, army basically. But it's much more easy to find Python developers than C developers. And right now, it's much more easy, I, I think, to do it in Python first, just to speed it up. And then, of course, they will do it with C uh, or, or Go. I think C would be better, maybe, because it's faster. But you're right, it's, it's not efficient at all. But again, prototyping, I think. I'm not sure they're crazy uh, to do it in Python, uh, but anyway. I think that Tesla does it in Java, though. I think that Tesla, yeah, does it in Java. So th there, there are some crazy people out there. Anyway. Um, I just wanted to ask a question in terms of the development cycle. Hi. Hi. Um, so the whole Android ecosystem was built basically on uh, ADB, Android Debug Bridge. Like, did they just rewrite that thing in Fuchsia, or are they just building another proprietary system for the, I don't know, company, new communication system. Uh, sorry, for what type of? Uh, for, for development, like uh, basically Android Studio, you know, you build oh. something, you push it, you install it. Have they changed the whole cycle to something else, or they just revert it and go no, to uh, so reuse the software? So the question is, uh, how do you develop uh, like the development cycle on, on that? No, it's, it's, it's actually, because it's on Fuchsia, uh, on Flutter, Basically, you can use whatever whatever um, IDE uh, you know you, you can, and and also because it's a compiled target, you can run it whatever. So basically, you can you can develop on a Mac or whatever type of machine, uh, and basically you can uh, you can develop on Android Studio, VS Code, and a, uh, and and a third one which I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, but like the the thing you built is pushed to the phone via the ADB protocol. So right. Uh, uh, that's the part I'm asking. Uh, Are they reusing the ADB daemon? No. Okay. No, 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 okay. no, no. Um, it's it's very messy right now. Like if you need to do anything there, you need to recompile everything, and then uh, you basically run it via Ethernet, which is absolutely hor horrible. Okay, got it. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, you you also like you also compile first the BIOS via Ethernet. And then you push the operating system via Ethernet. And if you want to release an app on the operating system right now, you need to recompile the entire operating system and push it. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it's Sounds not. Sounds like <laughs> fun development. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, no, <laughs> it's for prototype right now. So yeah, it's not a very good um, CI CD pipeline. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right. Any other question or. All right, I think Hi. I'm done. Thank you, Ado. Thank you. Thank you very much.